great we're recording now. Welcome to the show, Professor Brown. Yes, thank you, Anwesh. Good to be here. Yep. So, um, you know, the kind of just to introduce you to the format, I sort of have informal chats because, you know, if I ask, if I prepare questions beforehand, the conversation sort of loses the flow. So what I'm what we're going to do is we're just going to talk things out, you know, just like you do in your podcast. Sure. Um, so it's going to be very informal. But the first um, question that I have for you is, um, you know, based on you have a podcast out decoding the gurus mm. in which you essentially dismantle the secular gurus mm. now my sort of impression of it is that you know while i understand the point that larger point that you're getting at don't you think that you're being too loose with the term gurus because while i understand that there is a cultist behavior formed around this figures, whether it's Eric Weinstein or Jordan Peterson, but to a certain extent, that is true of almost every celebrity. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of people are Scientologists simply because Tom Cruise says that, you know, Scientology is good. So sort of every celebrity has, you know, those kind of fans. So what exactly uh, separates these sort of gurus from um, the other kind of normal celebrities? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think there's a couple of things to be said there. Um, one thing is that, um, you know, we're obviously having a little bit of fun with the uh, decoding the guru's title and the format. So not everyone we cover is necessarily uh, a guru um, and, um, in, a, in, the, in a sort of bad sense, if you like. Um, so I think in terms of the people we'd like to cover, it, it's almost like a good excuse to cover interesting or controversial uh, or strange people. So, um, and that, that would include people that, that we like and, you know, p people that we don't like. So I, I could imagine, um, even though Richard Dawkins has gotten himself into a lot of trouble recently, he's something of a personal hero of mine since I read his books as a, as a young man on evolution and, go and, and, and got me into science, basically, um, and, and that worldview. Uh, and sent me down the road to doing a PhD. So I could imagine us covering him, even though I don't think he'd score, he'd, he'd rate very highly on the negative sort of aspects of guruness. So th that's the first thing. Um, the second thing, I guess, though, is that I think there is something that distinguishes um, gurus from just celebrities or public intellectuals. Um, so like if we take somebody who is extremely popular and maybe has people that, you know, think they're a genius, say, I'm thinking of someone else, maybe Noam Chomsky, for mm -hmm. instance, he's a, he's a good example. Now, I, to be honest, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not familiar with everything he's said and done, but I get the strong impression that he doesn't act like a guru at all. Um, and really just functions as very much as like an academic and sort of a public intellectual. So when we, when we, talk about gurus in the pejorative sense we we notice that there are a few things that people can do to be persuasive and and to give that feeling of truthiness and to give the sense that the people that follow have this uh, are getting an immense sense of insight and profundity from their content when actually they're often talking to just quite um shallow um, uh, arguments. So um, I, I can take you through our gurometer, you know, which is another bit of fun. But we we do we have identified a few themes that we think um, you tend to see um, in in gurus, and they apply pretty well to um, uh, some non secular or spiritual religious type gurus. But um, the secular gurus have a have some special things about them too. But if you look at the sort of non-secular religious gurus, you know, something like Deepak Chopra, you know, Deepak Chopra's, his rhetoric, it's not just rhetoric at this point, you know, his, what he does, his work is actively harming people in, in terms of promoting pseudoscience and, you know, ridiculous healing therapies or whatever he does. On the other hand, these gurus that you are talking about, all they do is promote um, ideas that may not be as well thought out as, uh, you know, I would say good scholarly ideas, but 
that sort of does not have that kind of personal effect on people as Deepak Chopra's rhetoric have. So there is clearly a line between someone like Chopra and someone like Eric Weinstein. Look, I agree. I think there is there are important differences between secular and religious spiritual gurus. And probably the most important difference is what you hinted at, which is that a spiritual or religious guru is, is offering you the meaning of life and for, you know, inner peace and fulfillment or um, whatever. So, um, and that's not something that secular gurus tend to do because they, they, they're doing secular stuff. On the other hand, when it comes to their political and social hot takes, they often do things like promote conspiracy theories, which you, you, one may argue that, say, promoting COVID skepticism or vaccine skepticism is not as harmful as what Deepak Chopra has been doing recently. To be honest, sorry, I, I've not kept track of Deepak Chopra, so you, you'd know better than me. But um, but still, it's it's not necessarily innocuous either. So, so tell me a bit more about the Guru Meter. Oh, the Guru Meter. <laughs> yeah, so it's, so we, this, this actually started, um, this collaboration between me and Chris started not with the idea of doing a podcast, but actually with the idea of maybe writing some articles together, um, either academic or popular articles. And we, we have some invitations from uh, some magazines to, to, to do so and we, have, we just never got around to we haven't gotten around to it been too busy um, so it sort of turned in so these notes um, eventually after doing a few episodes we we did a bit more writing and we started noticing these similar themes uh, so so one of them uh, I can take you through it really quickly and you can ask me about anything that catches your interest um, but we, we have this this notion of galaxy brainedness Right, so that you know that famous meme of the galaxy brain takes, and you know this is where the gurus do present the, their as themselves as offering these profound and uh, you know world changing uh, ideas. So this is kind of like the TED Talk effect. You know how you know those mm. those TED Talks sort of turned into kind of give. It's been parodied, and it's turned into giving people that feeling of insight without actually delivering um, the, the real thing, but they generally do claim to be essentially geniuses, either explicitly or implicitly, or to have, yeah, some world-changing um, uh, views. Um, cultishness is another, so, you know, so this is not much needs to be said about that. I mean, and this isn't necessarily, you know, when we think of a cult, you know, we think of people living in a compound and, you know, um, drinking Kool-Aid and stuff. But, you know, there are a lot of more subtle forms of social manipulation and in-group, out-group behavior, and like including flattery and stuff like that. Um, you know, giving people the sense that they're members of an elect club with, who are a bit special in some way. Um, and it could be that they're brave enough to go against the official, you know, narrative or that they're just, you know, intellectually curious people who aren't afraid to explore things, you know. So those things can be socially quite manipulative. Uh, I'm probably talking too long here. I'll try to keep it short. No, you've, you've, we've got all the time. We can talk as much as we Okay, so, so another one is this thing we've called anti-establishmentarianism. So we've, just, we've got very awkward titles. Uh, and, and that is they do tend to present themselves as... Um, iconoclasts and against the mainstream and when you think about it that's kind of necessary for a guru like it's like you can't be a guru and go yes well actually the experts um, are, are right about about COVID and yes that the general scientific consensus on climate change is pretty much correct and you know what I mean like that's you're not a guru unless you're offering something special and unique so um, the being against the establishment is actually quite useful because it provides the opportunity for them to carve out a niche as, I guess, a source, an epistemic uh, center, as a, as a source of knowledge that where people feel they just can't get the, the truth anywhere else. So I think that's quite important. Um, that they do tend to do a fair bit of grievance mongering. 
um, where they they often have stories of personal grievance. Again, Eric Weinstein is kind of like the the om, the omega, alpha and the omega of all this stuff. He's he's got, uh, uh, um, but you, you know you see it to some degree in all of them. It's it's interesting how thin skinned many gurus are and how quick they are to present themselves as a as a martyr or someone who's been victimized or ostracized in some way. And uh, they they tend to be narcissistic um, and uh, do a lot of self aggrandizement. Um, and then the other thing too, I guess, is these these revolutionary theories and what we call the Cassandra complex, which is they're usually warning against some impending doom. You know, they they're usually presenting themselves as as, as the person who's 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 um, you know trying to draw attention to some calamity that's that's going to strike us, um, which um, uh, yeah. And um, look, the other thing too is the pseudo profound bullshit. So this has been you know people have actually studied this and used Deepak Chopra as a bit of a model. Actually, just his form of language, just um, and you know he's obviously not alone in this at all. He's just the first man that springs to mind. But this is something that spiritual gurus do, which is to talk about you know a quantum hermeneutics of spiritual transcendence and just string big words together in a way that superficially sounds profound, but when you actually think about it, isn't really saying anything. Uh, so a, a lot of gurus tend to um, use that style of language uh, as well. Um, and look, finally, the, the important thing is the, uh, a relationship to conspiracy theories. So it's no coincidence that uh, many gurus tend to endorse conspiracy theories. And when you think about it, it's a bit like how they describe alternative and complementary medicine. When we, we can often define alternative medicine as simply like as soon as it actually has some evidence for it, then it tends to be not alternative medicine anymore and just becomes medicine. So there isn't any distinction apart from the fact that um, it hasn't uh, really got an evidence base for it. So I guess the same is true for conspiracy theories. They, because they are presenting these these fresh takes often speaking to people's prejudices or the things that they wanted to believe anyway. Um, and they are undermining conventional sources of authority or, or knowledge. So the conspiracies play an important role in, in justifying and explaining why all of the experts are lying to you about climate change or vaccines or whatever. So I could say a lot more about all that stuff, but that, that's <laughs> I've probably spoken enough. <laughs> Is it like a scale where you you know scale people from one to ten or high to low something like that? Yeah, we we do do a bit of scaling. Um, we do give people a score. Um, again, just mainly for a bit of fun, but but partly to check our to check our intuitions. So we we cover some people and find that they're not very um, guru esque, and to so almost as a way to explain to people why we don't think this person's a guru, or what we do think this person is a guru, uh, we find it's helpful to actually go through these criteria and give them a score just for our personal um, 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 just process, just because um, it's helpful to explain what what a guru is. It's not a guru isn't just someone we disagree with. It's not someone we just we don't like or whatever. It's that the, there is actually a method to our madness. So we find the scoring is a good process. Right. So you know, I want to dive into some of the gurus that you've covered till now. Let's start with uh, Brett Weinstein, who is you know Eric Weinstein would be the most obvious one. But we haven't talked much. To, nobody has talked much about Brett. So I'm you know I'm going to start with Brett. Um, you know, I did not know how, you know, convoluted his thinking on evolution was until I really checked, you know, a few days ago, because, you know, if you watch his videos on um, evolution, he has a lot of, you know, videos explaining uh, what he thinks about modern evolutionary biology and, you know, lots of tweets. And he claims that um, evolutionary theory as it exists today is not enough to explain complexity. Uh, and, you know, he goes against, he says that selection is, and mutations are sort of redundant in uh, many instances, like um, say some something like Peter Salmon Fish, say it goes to 
there are explorer modes he calls these explorer modes it goes to another you know place gets isolated from um, its population and grows and finds food and you know grows different from the population that it came from and he claims that this cannot be explained by evolution because these sort of creatures are actually adopted to evolve um, adopted to explore you know and so yeah. this cannot be explained by mutation and selection now mm -hmm. this sort of seems to me like what a lot of intelligent proponents say and you know a lot of what evolutionary um, psychologists say we can discuss about that later so kind of seems to me like Brett Weinstein has a very um, heterodox way of thinking about evolution which you know is not entirely based on evidence no so it's not please at all based elaborate on, on that <laughs> okay well i should i should caveat this by saying that i unlike brett i don't have a phd in evolutionary biology however i think i think it's fair to say that one his his views there have no evidence for them and and two there there isn't anybody credible with a research track record that is saying anything similar and Three, I think this is just an example of, you know, a, a guru present, a, a wannabe guru presenting themselves as having revolutionary theories and being a galaxy brain, because of course evolution can't be right. You know, he's got to have this fresh new insight, which explains what's really going on. Look, the, there's a long history of, you know, um, evolutionary theory, as, as you know, is ex extraordinarily well advanced in, in terms of the, the modern synthesis. You know, and it is, you know, look, we, we, we don't want to get into it too deep, but it, it, it is, as you said, fundamentally based on, on individual selection. Yeah, which, um, and, um, and random mutations. So look, there are interesting nuances to the uh, modern synthesis. For instance, there is this concept of neutral theory which is that, you know, even without selective pressures, you can still have speciation and mm -hmm. variation kind of developing just kind of in a, a neutral way. And, you know, there, there is, that is quite a respectable theory. Uh, but again, to what degree that, it's not really a challenge, it's just an elaboration on the, the modern synthesis. Likewise, some of the big controversies between uh, Richard Dawkins and Gould, I've forgotten his first name. Stephen um, J. Steve, Gould. Stephen J. Gould, thanks. Um, some of that was based around him having a bit of a similar kind of hot take around punctuated e uh, equilibrium mm -hmm. and to explain things like the Cambrian explosion and so on, which I, I, ne I never fully understood Gould's point of view, frankly, because it just seemed like a, a problem of understanding timeframes, yeah? You know, that yes, no one disputes that there are long sort of geological periods where very little evolution happens. You know, sharks, for instance, have been very stable for ages. Then there are other periods where niches open up and or some sort of new genetic kind of um, new spaces in the fitness landscape become apparent. You see this great, this great profusion of speciation and so on. So look, I mean, there's, there's a history to this, um, doubtless um, with um, things like um, um, you know, un understanding how um, genes are actually transcribed into proteins and how, how cells and stuff actually um, influence the picture. There'll be further elaborations, but what Brett is suggesting is just totally implausible. Like it just has no connection to any um, respectable um, um, nuances being made to the modern synthesis. And, you know, the idea that species enter into an explorer mode or somehow decide to do that well he just raises more questions <laughs> it just begs so many questions doesn't it like like well, how do they decide it's stock is no benefit yes yeah for, from an individual point of, from an individual's point of view with you know a physical point of view like there are there is no species that makes a decision to go okay i'm going to go into an explorer mode now and and you know genes can't make this um, decisions like that um you know all individuals are perpetually in explorer mode just by the, the standard mechanisms of um, random mutation, sexual selection, um, um, sexual combination, and um, 
yeah and, and fitness so yeah it's he, i yeah sorry to be dismissive of his ideas there but i i just wanted to try to explain that they're not yeah it's quite surprising for someone who does have a phd in evolutionary biology to mm, what make what seems to be such a naive and silly suggestion yep i agree about that and he um you know he does it repeatedly like you said that he has this idea that you know he has the final evolutionary theory and the rest of people are just you know not doing anything good um in one of his tweets in fact he says that uh darwinian only darwin was right and uh, you know darwinian textbook as it exists today is you know highly improbable you know he agrees with david gallanter over that so it's 99% improbable so you know and and that is the same point that a lot of id proponents make you know so he sort of kind of provides them with the you know the food to sort of feed on yeah so, I, i i agree with you there i think there are some even though he wouldn't say that he's got yeah. anything to do with id i think structurally it's got a lot of similarities in conjuring up this kind of ineffable unmeasurable sort of invisible hand that's kind of um must be at play because um because it, it, yeah anyway well he he says it's uh, consciousness that we haven't discussed you know, that consciousness is what propels uh, organisms to develop and not natural selection in his uh, video about explorer modes like i i don't really fully understand what he means uh, by consciousness because it's very complicated topic you know for mm. from an evolutionary perspective how exactly are you going to define consciousness mm. so um but but uh it brings me back to his conversation with dawkins because he says that evolutionary theory stopped developing and producing new research in 1976 when dawkins book uh, the surface gene was published now in his conversation with dawkins the first thing that he does is is very dismissive of mathematical models now here's the thing i don't like mathematics but that doesn't mean that mathematical models do not work they obviously do work and it's sort of contradictory because dawkins entire sort of the surface gene is entirely based on mathematics and dawkins does not mention the fact that it's based on mathematics it like the book doesn't go into detail about mathematics because he has this um you know way up with words he converts mathematics into words very simple understandable and engaging mm-hmm. but that does not mean that the theory itself does not have mathematics i mean it's one of the um, greatest innovations in game theory hamilton's uh, or williams you know both of their ideas so um and he one of the things that he does say about mathematical models is that mathematical models predict improbable events which is that um if you isolate some variables then you'll be able to predict that a sphere can be balanced on a reason now you can predict that but you have to understand that the variables you know mathematics is mathematical no, models and not the exact facts but are actually approximations of the truth and when evolutionary theorists develop mathematical models they are trying to understand how much um say one variable has if effect on um say adaptation or selection than the other variable so it's sort of a comparative analysis so i don't really get his uh, criticism of mathematical models no uh, I, i have to say i don't really get it either yeah i think you know it does remind me like his dismissal of evolutionary theory and making up that it's been in a rut since 1979 or whatever i mean to to some degree i think it's true like the the kernel of truth there is that evolutionary theory is quite mature yeah as a as a theory Com- compared to theories we have in psychology yeah it's it's like you know um several orders of uh, orders of magnitude more mature and the same is true uh, in physics of course where we have you know quantum mechanics and and and, and um, general relativity are extraordinarily uh, mature theories and as a result they they're pretty good approximations of reality 
and it becomes like almost exponentially harder to to refine and improve on those models simply because they are so so good now there's not there are obviously interesting nuances to explore with evolutionary theory but there are no serious problems with it like or you know it's got to be the most well supported theory um, in the, the 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 biological sciences and perhaps even the physical sciences, but um, so certainly in um, in in physics, they they are aware that they do not have a grand unified theory. This is well known. They would they would desperately like one. It's a very difficult thing to do because of the limits of measurement, dealing with the very very small, very high energy particle physics and so on. So that's the kernel of truth in both Brett and his brother's claims. Yeah, that these fields, <laughs> which they purport to be revolutionary geniuses in, but but have no track, no research track record to speak of, um, very little research background apart from their PhD. Now, I don't know if most people know how academia works, but you know, you need to you need to keep I think going. Brad after has around three or four papers. Three or four papers. Yeah. Now, I'm a pretty mediocre. Uh, academic and I have about 160, <laughs> right? I'm not. I'm That's not, I'm more not than Jordan Peterson. Yeah, look, and, uh, look, but my point there is that yeah, that is not that is not a research track record, um, and you know, and I'm 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 a nobody, frankly. I don't claim to be a revolutionary genius of any kind. So it's it's you know, this is where you know when we're talking about the gyrometer, I, we keep coming back to the narcissism. And the self-aggrandizement, because I, I feel like you just cannot understand gurus. Sorry, I was just getting a message about a low battery for my headset. Sorry, I should have charged it for longer, perhaps, but I will keep going. So, yeah, my, my point there is that you have to be some kind of narcissist in order to claim so much with so little. Um, it's it, it's astonishing. It, it's it's like somebody saying, "Well, I've I've had a bit of a think about it, and I'm pretty sure climate change isn't happening, and vaccines are all a bad idea, right?" And and just dismissing the hundreds, <laughs> the, the thousands and thousands of professionals, yeah, who have spent extraordinarily intelligent and talented people, who who have spent and their entire lives in this field, and, and then just waving your hand. And proclaiming that they're all wrong and you're right please please listen to my podcast and donate <laughs> to my patreon <laughs> perhaps the most explosive claims that he makes uh, was about the um, anti-semitism in the nazi germany which is it i think that the argument that he was making is that there, there was some sort of selection mechanism built into uh, the Nazis, which led them to do what they did, and that we should talk about. Uh, he essentially said that every social phenomena can be explained to, to the lens of evolution, and that because we, um, unless we find out what those selection mechanisms are, we cannot combat it. So we should talk about you know how it makes sense in the uh, process of select uh, process of evolution. So what exactly is wrong with that? Well, that's, that's the kind of naive claim that would make an evolutionary psychologist blush. Um, it's, <laughs> it's all, it, and, and they've been known to... And they're uh, far out there. They're far out there, that's right. Um, so that's, of course, just silly. To, and, you know, I, I, I remember watching that video and it's, it's almost a delight to, to watch and see poor Richard Dawkins' <laughs> expression. <laughs> and his tone of voice, which is about the most cut, you know, the English are masters of passive aggression, I think, very different from Australians. And, you know, Dawkins' polite response is probably the most cutting thing I've, I've ever heard. But, um, yeah, look, it's, it's obviously silly to, 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 to take historical events like, like what, what, what happened in the, the mid 20th century in, in Europe and to, to to draw this direct line to some particular genetic feature of Germanic peoples um, is 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 just ridiculous. I don't even know where to begin to describe how what a silly idea that is. Or hopefully to 
anyone who hears that idea, it's self-evidently silly, right? You don't have to be an evolutionary biologist or a psychologist or a historian or a social scientist of any kind to recognize how silly that is. And it is just staggering to me that anyone, let alone somebody with a PhD, actually thought that that was a good idea like a good to to suggest to Richard Dawkins in a public <laughs> forum. Like it's astonishing. It kind of reeks of eugenics as well, because he said, you know, the reason he's talking about it because he wants to combat it. Like, how are you going to combat it? Say you find a gene um, which you know makes humans prone to doing that. How are you going to combat it in a group without the use of you know human intervention? Uh, in pop in giving birth in populace and whatever so you have to you know there is a direct line there which leads to eugenics and the same can be said of let's say psychopaths you know the problem with that and tell me if this example is wrong say uh, psychopaths have a certain you know you can basically map out the brain of psychopaths and figure out with certain accuracy whether this brain is that of a psychopath or not to neuroimaging but say you figure out that of um of a child you know who say you do his neuroimaging and find out that he's a psychopath now it might be that the child is high in narcissism it might be that the child has borderline personality disorder it might be that the child has um say he's a psychopath but you know, conscientious kind of psychopath, the ones who walk in corporate and, you know, the snakes in suits kind of psychopath. So in that sense, it's very comp it's a very complicated topic. So you, you cannot like reduce it to simply simple genes. So is that an accurate, you know, example of what he's saying? Oh, look, I, I have no idea what he's saying because it's, it's silly, but um speaking more generally yeah like i mean look his idea is just totally implausible right but let's uh, I, let's say it were true then i guess um um you're right that it might um you know advise that there should be some kind of um eugenics to kind of eliminate these bad genes but but even that doesn't follow, honestly, because pretty much all genes have a huge number of positive and negative effects, you know, and extremely complex effects. So you can eliminate something that, except, you know, there are some very specific genes that um, in which, you know, it's probably one might consider not having children because of birth defects and things like that. But, but the vast majority of them are, have, a, have a mixture of diffuse kind of positive and negative effects. Um, so something like, psychopathy or sociopathy or various mental disorders they're extremely complex phenomena right so so you know you, you obviously know that the, the our developmental process of our brains socialization all that stuff it it's it's such a complicated process so the while there may well be ultimately at the bottom of this some genetic basis and certainly with mental disorders or um, certain other um, um, behavioral traits um, we, we, we can see some, you know, evidence for, um, um, you know, a, a genetic component to it. Pretty much everything um, that you see expressed arises via a, uh, a, an interaction between, between the genome and, the, and, first of all, the biology, and then an interaction between the biology and the environment. So it's, it's very complex. And the more complex the, um, the, the trait, for instance, let's say being prone to extroversion or, or having a hot temper, being prone to violence. You know, I don't think there is any trait which is making you prone to invade Eastern Europe, but you know, that's, that's, that's just that we, we shouldn't talk about that. But, um, but you know, something like being a hot tempered or angry sort of person that may, may have a genetic basis, but it's just layered on so many, there's so many levels of learning, development. Um, uh, basic uh, environment biological interactions that it's it's very hard to say oh you've got this gene okay you're going to be a um, someone who loses their temper easily or a sociopath or a, a psychopath um, so yeah do you think that he's um, you know essentially making an argument for he's essentially making an argument that evolutionary psychologists make because I think what he's doing is he's reducing everything to adaptation. Yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, in doing so, you know, Gould made an excellent point in his um, debate about evolutionary psychology with Steven Pinker. He said that um, you cannot reduce everything to adaptation because what evolutionary psychologists do is they look at something which may have utility. And they say that because it has utility, they create a story around it that explains it in terms of adaptationist terms. Uh, now, that misses out the fact that there were actually, they might have been spandrels, they might have developed even uh, initially as byproducts and then finally have uh, acquired some utility. So, how are you going to? like make a difference between what is a byproduct and what is an adaptation because evolutionary psychologists kind of end up making everything to adaptation. This is not to say that all of evolutionary psychologists, uh, mm. psychology is bad, of course, but yeah, yeah. You know, there no, are no, certain... that's, yeah, that, that's, that's a good, that's a good summing up. I think of the, 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 the pros and cons there. Um, I just want to agree with you, first of all, that that's the problem that, so there's, most people who are on the internet are familiar with the, it's the bad evolutionary psychology papers that get shared around and talked about. And there is quite a lot of them and they can be really silly. And it's the similar kind of problem, which as you described, it's always assuming that there is direct one to like direct causal connection between any kind of behavior or trait that we can observe and fitness. Yeah. And that's, that's a mistake, obviously. One, obviously, there's huge cultural effects going on, um, and two, um, often, you know, we there are like there is no like it would be silly like uh, it would be silly to search for some like people have a propensity. Some people have a propensity to be depressed, for instance. Now you can, and I'm talking clinical depression. It, it would be silly to go searching and looking for the evolutionary benefits of being clinically depressed. Right. <laughs> and, but, you know, we, our brains are extremely complex things and they have many, many opportunities to, to go wrong in either adaptive or maladaptive ways. The other thing, too, of course, is we live in, in a very artificial environment. So this is where the culture comes in. So culture in the broader sense, like everything, everything that we make, everything that we transmit, our language, like it's, it's the same as with other animals um, that, that, that do have simpler forms of culture that is culture. Now that has big effects um, on us. So living in a modern, artificial, synthetic environment is actually eliciting an awful lot of behaviors that that really weren't designed for this for this environment. So if you take something like pornography, for instance, that just simply wasn't an option for hunter gatherers. <laughs> right? So there, you know, it, it's clearly diverting a um, you know, an, an instinct or a, a sexual drive, for instance, that, that clearly has a, a, an evolutionary purpose in terms of motivating people to, to um, procreate. But, you know, it, it doesn't have any evolutionary purpose in itself. Now, that's an easy example to see, but there's a wide variety of things that you see expressed in modern synthetic environments that just wouldn't, wouldn't have occurred uh, normally. So, so yes, uh, Brett is sort of making just the most, yeah, it, it's a very obvious example of the evolutionary psychologist's fallacy. Gould is correct in saying that it's it's often hard to tell when something is a spandrel, when it's just a byproduct and when it actually serves some sort of function. But, you know, it, it's not true to say that evolutionary psychology cannot make predictions and be te and which are actually testable and, and can be confirmed but you'll find that the good evolutionary psychology is quite boring like it's quite it's reasonably obvious things um so like i can give you an example from my own research so for instance in in um in looking at addiction and gambling and risk taking so this is something where you know it, it it's pretty well understood and in fact they've even identified um, uh, the um, neurotransmitters such as dopamine. There's a whole system in our brains which sort of govern our uh, attraction towards sources of reward um, and willingness to to take impulsive action and court in, in order to obtain those um, rewards. And there's strong associations with, between um, like certain so that so there are DRD 
The DRD2 receptor, for instance, is associated with what they call dopaminergic dysfunction, which is basically just a, basically running on running a dopamine fueled behavior. So this has been associated with risk taking. So completely separately, we've we've got the psychological research where we've measured things like behavioral impulsivity, um, and and looking how it's it, it's a trait that lends itself to. Um, well, you know, you, you see it higher in people who've got problems with gambling, people who've got problems with, with drugs or alcohol and so on. Uh, also um, crime, etc. So the, the, these are all risky behaviours that are usually um, um, for the purposes of obtaining a sort of a quick, immediate reward, often at the expense of your long term sort of benefit. Now, the thing that we see cross culturally, as one of the most robust findings, is that young men tend to be more impulsive. Yeah, I mean, does, Anwish, does that, does that gel with your personal experience? <laughs> <laughs> Do you? <laughs> uh, uh, so, I mean, in the sense that young men tend to be more prone to take risks, more, more likely to, to um, impulsive behavior and so on. And, and then, so that's true when you measure it using a psychological self-report scale. But of course, we also see rates of criminal crime, um, criminal behavior are much higher among young men. We see young men are at the greatest risk of uh, having, um, uh, you know, um, a drug addiction, um, drinking too much, e even having car accidents, Drive, driving a car in, in a risky way and driving it too fast or whatever, and, and smashing it up. If you're an insurer, you don't want to insure young men because they're going to smash the car. So the, the, the other thing we see it in is, is in gambling problems. It's one of the strongest effects. Young men have a rate of gambling problems that is oh, probably about 15 or 20 times higher than other demographic groups. And, and, and for young women, it's, it's virtually the same. So the rates of problem gambling amongst young women is pretty much the same as for older women, pretty much the same as older men. But it's young men that really spike. So there's a, there's a perfectly good evolutionary explanation for why young men tend to be uh, more prone to risk taking. And, you know, I find it quite convincing. So we could, um, you know, we can't know that it's certainly true, but for a psychologist, we like to know why, you know, when, when, when we get the data and, and we see effects and we see strong effects, then it's natural for us to ask ourselves, well, why, why do we see this so consistently across so many different behaviors um, across different cultures as well? Yep, I do agree because I think they're the strongest sort of proponents of evolutionary psychologists. Nobody really talks about them or, you know, their sort of version of evolutionary psychology is not popular. I think one of the strongest proponents is Steven Pinker and nobody really, and Steven Pinker thinks that culture and music and that and all of these things are not adaptations, which contradicts what, you know, many popular evolutionary psychologists is someone like, you know, for, on Twitter, God Saad or, um, yeah. Geoffrey Miller or people, yeah. evolutionary biologists like David Sloan and Wilson would think, but you know he's not that popular in that field in the public yeah. realm, right? No. So that, well, that, that's what I've seen. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'll just very briefly. Like I, I have, I have a textbook on evolu textbooks on evolutionary psychology in my office. I have big, thick introductions to psychology where there's chapters on evolutionary psychology. Now, those hot takes and those, you know, edgy articles that you see, you might see online, that's that's not in the textbooks. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, that's not, none of it is standard. Um, and you never hear people talking about the stuff that is in the textbooks because it's not, it's not controversial. It's not particularly um, exciting. Um, it's just, you know, it's, but, but it's, but it's actually quite reasonable. So I think it is worth saying that, you know, yes, there is a fair bit of evolutionary psychology that is bad. Yes, it's one of the slightly more, you know, social psychology generally yeah. is also, it can be a bit dodgy. Um, but there is a core to it that is perfectly good and reasonable and solid. Um, so I think it would be silly for people to, you know, well, it would be a shame for people to get the wrong impression, I think. But we also have to understand the fact that evolutionary psychology is relatively new. Like it started 
you know, getting popular, getting the research started only in the 80s and 90s with Toby and Cosmetics. So, you know, you cannot expect a field as new as evolutionary psychology to suddenly be as credible or, you know, have as much H index as that of uh, evolutionary yeah. biology or any other scientific field. So you have to let it develop. And mm. But I, I think that the normal sort of, uh, you know, thing that people believe about evolutionary psychology gives it a bad image, which is why, you know, most people are fairly reasonably angry when they, you know, read someone like, uh, you know, rape as an adaptation or suicide as an adaptation. So it's normal to assume that they would be angry and they would think that evolutionary psychology, you know, these people support a sort of conservative, yeah. you know, bronzes yeah. kind of morality. Yeah. Well, but, you know, um, in terms of the political frame, this, that touches on an interesting point, actually, that one of the mistakes everybody makes, but partic uh, particularly people who think politically, is that it's a version of the naturalistic fallacy, which is that just because something is natural, yeah, that must mean that it's fine, <laughs> that it's okay, that it's good, maybe. Yeah. Now this is not true <laughs> at all. Yeah. There's nothing good about evolution. There's nothing actually even good about fitness. Yeah. It's it, good. What is good and what is bad are, are human values that, that we decide. And in fact, you can think of consciousness and our entire culture as a kind of um, like Dawkins himself described as a kind of um, like, like software, like a parasite, like a software parasite that kind of took over our brain. So our brains, which used to be just designed, just existed for the pure purpose of going, of driving our bodies to go out in the world, to get resources and find mates and avoid predators and so on. And just for the stupid, pointless purpose of replicating genes. Yeah. Now, um, now that's, that's not what we use our brains for today. Yeah. That's not what we value as, as human beings, as individuals and as a society. So what I find is a lot of the hate towards Evo Psyche comes from, uh, and, and, but also the love on the part of the conservatives, yeah, who, who like to, you know, men's rights, organize people and stuff like that. They, they often pick out or invent some kind of nonsensical evolutionary rash, rationalization or justification for whatever it is they want. And, you know, that is, you know, hopefully really obviously wrong. Well, first, first of all, they're, they're, it's usually bad <laughs> Evo psych or just Evo psych they've just made up um, uh, um, that, that justifies it. But even if it was good Evo psych that, that they were drawing upon, it would still be the wrong thing to do because there is evolution provide and the natural world generally provides no justification for our political or moral or ethical um, views. Uh, yeah. But people do have this idea that what is natural is good because, you know, that is one of the oppositions that, um, say, conservatives have for homosexuality. You know, it's unnatural, so it's not good. So, you know, that sort of uh, thinking is sort of innate in us. You know, we keep, you know, making that mistakes, even though we do not want to you know, make that mistake. So, you know, naturally, this, this like, fallacy is sort of, you know, what is the default mode. And, it's very yeah. hard to move away from that, you know. So if someone, you know, says that it's, uh, you know, explains some, something to the lens of evolution, then we normally assume that it's natural, so it must be good, even though, you know, that is not the right way to think. And besides the fact that we have actual um, racists, you know, who have tried to use evolutionary psychology, Kevin McDonald. Um, who I'm sure you were aware of, evolutionary psychologist who promotes a sort of anti-Semitic, you know, theory through his using evolutionary psychology jargon, you know, that does not give it a good image. No. Right. So I understand the hate that comes around and, but I am, you know, having read Steven Pinker and having read a bit of literature, I think that evolutionary psychology is useful and that, you know, it is, it has a long way to go, but uh, it's not as useless or, you know, people's perception of it is not really accurate. To some extent it is, but, you know, normally yeah. speaking. Yeah. So why, um, you know, as a psychologist and a statistician, I wanted to ask you this because you're a professor of bot psychology and statistics. And so you will probably have a good answer to this question. 
Why do you think psychology is going to a replication crisis? Oh, uh, sorry, did you ask why? Yeah. Yeah, why? Oh, um, the incentive structures in academia in a nutshell. And in fact, that's connected to the evolutionary psych stuff. Like why are there such weak um, um, evolutionary psych papers that are flashy, you know, seem like they've discovered some exciting new thing. Wow, this is why women let, wear lipstick, you know? You know, you'll never guess it's because of it. You know, um, you know, with a very, very underpowered, very just bad papers. And that's because there's this incentive to, to publish a lot but then there is an incentive on the part of journals to, to both accept a lot of papers, but also to publish papers that are exciting. So not null, you know, papers that find null results are not published, papers which sort of debunk and say, no, look, there's nothing to that, get, um, don't get published. Or because the pub, the, they're looking for citations, essentially, because they're perceived as boring. So the incentive structures in academics is to publish um, a, a lot of, papers and it is not to you know systematically check and be more cautious uh, um, and and to um yeah essentially rigor and caution is, is unfortunately not encouraged by the incentive structure but rather publishing a flashy new finding is incentivized and as a result, so there are a lot of tricks and games people can play in terms of p-hacking, in terms of just yeah fiddling with your with your model specification or gathering somewhat more data. Maybe you do it three times and oh, you, it's significant this time, so you publish it this time, and the other ones stay in the file drawer. There there are a bunch of ways in which it can happen. Sometimes not even deliberately or maliciously, it, it can actually happen in good faith. Um, so we need to do better. So that is, you know, there's a, a reckoning that's happened in social psychology is, is the worst culprit. Fortunately, the area that I tend to work with, I tend to stay away from, it tends to be the smaller, lower powered experimental type studies, which are badly affected by that kind of thing. So people like myself, for instance, I have a data set that I was analyzing on Friday, which has 60,000 responses in it. So with that kind of data set, you're not going to run into the kinds of issues that can lead to a problem with replication. Yeah, I can, I will, I can guarantee you if somebody else goes out and gathers a similar size data set, measures the same variables, they will find the same relationships that I'm seeing here. So yeah, the, the replication crisis is happening because of the kinds of metrics like um, publication count, citation count that gets, um, gets uh, PhD students a job yeah, in, in academia, gets an academic tenure and essentially makes their career. It's to, yeah, unfortunately, they're incentivized to be prolific and to be, um, to, to be sexy and exciting and interesting, but not to be boring and cautious and, um, and rigorous. So this is, and this is why you see so many bad evolutionary psychology papers. And this is why we saw a lot, especially in social psychology, a lot of theories that kind of sounded good, but with relatively weak um, empirical data supporting them and the and things that were never tested, like, like were never checked, um, never replicated. So it's really good that, um, you know, it, it took too long, but it's good that the fields have recognized the problems themselves and are now in the process of fixing the problem. You seem to be implying that, you know, in, in hard science as something like physicist, you know, there is this disdain towards popular physicist, say uh, someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson and this popular public intellectual science popularizes from the academic community. Now you're saying that in psychology, it's the opposite. That is, you know, if you're popular enough, if you, you know, get the, um, attention that you from newspapers or media or whatever then you are actually incentivized to do that you're incentivized to you know have these results that um are pop that will be of interest to the general public so is that well not so, actually not so i mean that's kind of a byproduct but i actually it's just uh, attractive to your to your peers so if if i 
if I do a study where I do a careful check of say the, the bystander effect and I found, I found no results. Yeah. No effect. So that's going to be a lot harder for me to publish than, than if I just ignored that and done and did something new instead, thought of my own interesting theory and, and gathered some data and most importantly found a significant effect. So you get rewarded just in terms of citations. So not according to the public's opinion, but just in terms of the academic reward system, what gets you promoted, what gets you hired and so on. It is is based around, I guess, sexy results. So, so the the kind of replication work and the kind of debunking work, the kind of thing that's necessary to sort of prune the the trash, if you like, the the um, those bad results is uh, for a long time was not really done, and we were too relaxed about um, allowing these findings that were weakly supported to just be accepted as as facts when in fact an awful lot of careful work had to be done before we before we placed any confidence in them what's whatsoever yeah. well you know i would really like to discuss about all the gurus but we cannot you know get through all of them but because we were talking about psychology let's get into jordan peterson now you know, the political stuff so messes everything up. How does he do in, when it comes to psychology? Oh, well, uh, well, it's interesting. He, he, he doesn't do that well. <laughs> he, he, okay, it should be said Jordan Peterson has uh, a, a reasonably good research track record. And like I haven't, I'm, you know, his area is not an area of mine that I'm interested in. But he's, you know, un, unlike the, the Weinsteins, he's, he's, um, he's been, you know, a solid researcher for, you know, a, a large part of his career. But I think in his popular writing, he, um, his connections with psychology or orthodox psychology are pretty tenuous. You know, he seems much more strongly influenced by his religion than by his psychology training and psychology background. And, you know, when he does um, sort of sprinkle his popular writing with scientific, you know, academic, psychological or, or biological references, um, like famously to crustaceans or lobsters, I think, um, you know, they're, at, at least from what I've seen, it's, it's, it's a, it's a bit of a stretch, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like the stuff that he's talking to really reflect any um, any particular insights in psychology? Now, that's not to say that a lot of his advice is not, you know, reasonably well supported. For instance, you know, you know, embracing an attitude of self responsibility and you know, organizing the little things in your life and so on. Like a lot of his sort of self help advice, I'm, I suspect, is perfectly congruent with with psychology. Um, but I don't, I, I haven't seen that it's much influenced by it. But it probably is that his religious views or whatever is influenced by um, Carl Jung. Now, before Jordan Peterson, I did not think that there were any actual Jungian psychologists, <laughs> you know, but after Jordan Peterson, you know, because he sort of is a deep Jungian to the core, you know, everybody who talks about Jung and Freud nowadays, you know, just talks about them in a sort of dismissive way and gets, you know, what they did get right repressive memories or you know in terms of therapy but Jordan Peterson seems to be a deep Jungian he actually believes that there is something called Jungian synchronity that all these religions and cultures around the world have something similar in them that there is such a thing called collective unconscious and these ideas you know even though they, uh, def they were developed by a psychologist uh, I think are deeply anti-scientific absolutely yeah i agree with all of that yeah it's it's fascinating that he is such a deep Jungian because as you say they're pretty thin on the ground these days i mean the only place that i've seen any references to freudian or Jungian thought in a kind of an admiring kind of way is from is in philosophy and critical theory 
So when I when I looked at a textbook of a critical social psychology textbook, it, it talked about its influence, like the sort of the paradigms or the lenses or you know epistemic standpoints or something, and it, it listed the usual things, you know, Marxism, feminism, whatever, Hegel, something or other. But I was really surprised to see a whole section there on Freud and Jung, and the psychoanalytic perspective. And I was just amazed, like, what? <laughs> this is this is like one of your one of your you know sort of a valued perspective to see. I didn't, I, I honestly didn't realize that um, outside of psychology that they had any influence. Now, you know, as as you say, look, they were look, they were clever people. It was a, a different time, as they say, and um, I'm sure people could derive some insights from their writing. But as you say, it's it's entirely un unscientific and is entirely uninfluential in orthodox psychology these days so yeah i think he is a deep jungian in that he truly believes that there is a deep spiritual reality of of, of symbols and, and and meaning and so on that is kind of essentially he's described it as religious i think that is actually underlies physical reality and in many ways kind of drives it is more fundamental than than the material plane. Um, so, you know, he is a, you know, a spiritual, you know, um, sort of anti-scientific person. He's an anti-materialist in a, in a very deep sense. He's certainly not, not alone in that. A lot of people um, um, sort of believe something similar, but uh, yeah, it is, it is worth noting. Yeah, and I think the most absurd thing that he did say was the uh, DNA thing. You know, he saw the Chinese uh, intertwined dragons and said that, you know, this thing represents DNA. And I really do believe that. He kept saying that, you know, this is actually the, as if it's actually the truth and not something that he just made up. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's interesting, isn't it? It's that sort of synchron, it's that belief in synchronicity. Um, I, last time I heard somebody talking about synchronicity, it was, by a very amusing guy who, who, um, he's a conspiracy theorist or a UFO sort of believer who believes that owls are kind of actually aliens, but in some sort of shape shifting kind of shape. Anyway, he's big on synchronicity that you know you see something here, like every time you see an owl, then you know you see the number three or something, and there's these these connections and correspondences, and it is such. It's almost like it's. It's almost refreshing in a way because they're actually making explicit and transparent the the conspiratorial ideation that's going on in their minds which is and that that delusional ideation you you see it in people who are suffering from schizophrenia as well which is just the, the random co-occurrence of of things just coincidence essentially um just a huge amount of of meaning and importance is invested into such trivial coincidences so I think I think Jordan Peterson is, um, yeah, somewhat somewhat um, affected by that. But you know, it makes for somewhat. It, you know, if you give yourself permission to do that, then when you think about it, it's very liberating. It's very freeing. Like you can see meaning uh, everywhere. And and if you give yourself permission to to see it and believe it, then it can make you very prolific and and allow you to 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 write. Um, tracks, I suppose, in a, um, that that are appealing to people because you can very easily create this sort of rich tapestry of meaning, which you know I think is attractive to people. And the reason we see patterns uh, has a deep evolutionary um, reason, which is yeah. you know we see faces, you know, we attribute intention when there isn't the theory yeah. of mind. Like we see. Faces in clouds, but we never see clouds in faces. <laughs> no, no, that's that's exactly right. And actually, that's that's. A, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's a that's a nice example actually of a very standard evolutionary psych sort of ten, you know um, principle, which which I think is completely true. So you know, in gambling too, you know, it's, it's well known that gamblers see see patterns and in in the, you know and that they think they can predict the future of 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 what's going to happen next. That, that propensity. And so we are trigger happy when it comes to seeing patterns where just these pattern matching machines and we are quite happy to make false positives. And, you know, when you think about it, it's often a good idea to be trigger happy and not adopt a kind of sort of perfectly kind of rational or 
or mathematically optimal approach because it's better to think you saw a tiger yeah, yeah. nine times and be, be wrong than to you know set your threshold too low and miss the tiger when the tiger's really there and and likewise it's um yeah so it's it's a good idea to search for patterns and you know likewise even if it's something good so you know if if, if you're looking for something of value if you're looking for your car keys for instance you know you go oh what's that oh no it's just a it's just a wrapper oh what's that? you know you know like finding things it, it's better often mistakes false positives which is what we call thinking you see something when it's not really there um it, it's often uh, you know in you know to, to to your benefit to have that to have that bias so i think you're right there's that the the problem though is what is when we take that kind of those heuristics and biases which are well understood and have a very functional purpose in sort of day-to-day -day life or in a more natural kind of environment. But when we apply that to a more abstract questions, like thinking about the economy or thinking about politics or thinking about vaccines, then that can lead us astray. So, so people are great observational learners, we're great social learners. And, and we learn in our own personal lives by, by our experiences and, and, and noticing that, um, oh, so, um, so somebody did this and afterwards they got sick, yeah? that's that's really good kind of um, heuristics to follow that personalized learning when you're trying to figure out what to eat, that's not going to make you sick. But, but if you rely on that, then you can make mistakes as they did with the connection between um, like the uh, Wakefield uh, case of making a connection between the, what is it? The um, measles, mumps and rubella um, MMR vaccine and autism. So, what happened is that pe people were noticing that the kids kids who got the MMR vaccine, um, people were noticing, oh, and then, and then a few weeks later, they were diagnosed with autism. So that's a hugely traumatic thing to be, for have a child diagnosed with autism. So your brain kicks into kind of learning mode. What could explain this terrible event? Oh, they, they had the MMR vaccine. So no matter how many statistics were shown, which is, which is that there were you know, for millions and millions of kids who had the vaccine who didn't develop autism, that doesn't matter to you if you're focused more on that sort of interpersonal, social and, and personalized learning. And of course, what they failed to, to notice or, or, or to keep in mind was that the MMR vaccine is given at a particular age in, for, for kids around the same time as it happens, that when, if a kid is going to develop autism, then that's about the time that it will become apparent and that they will be that they'll be diagnosed. It's just at that developmental stage in, in their life. So in other words, statistically speaking, just a pure coincidence in terms of that's the, those are the age reigns where, where you start to see these events. No attention is paid to all the kids that are getting the vaccines, which which do, without any kind of negative side effects, but the few positives that, that did occur are hugely emotionally salient get all over the newspapers and so on so that this is what so you know these heuristics that that are quite adaptive in in sort of many more natural situations are very bad when reasoning about low probability events for instance interesting so um one of the things that i've noticed about all of the gurus that you've covered is that almost all of them have a grand unifying theory of everything uh jordan peterson does and uh Eric Weinstein obviously is famous for his, you know, theory of everything, geometric unity or whatever. So uh, why do you think that they have a sort of this obsession with this theory of everything? Is it going to redeem them in some format or does it attract followers or what is yeah. it? No, I think that's true. Look, I think more generally, most gurus have a totalizing worldview, right? Which is that, you know, er everything fits together. Yeah, that, that there's, you know, it's, it's all connected, you know, for instance, you know, Eric's bad experiences as a PhD student is connected to these fundamental problems in academia, which is connected to a fundamental conspiracy that's happening in the economy, which is connected to, you know, globalists and, the, and, the, and so on, right? So it, it's this totalizing worldview. And even someone like Scott Adams, who is, who is a right-wing ideologue, has that totalizing worldview which is that oh it's all a plot it's all a trick it's all being run by these clever people that are you know you see what's going on here and even russell brand 
has has this kind of thing. So look, I think partly it's it's their brand. You know, it, it's their brand. It's their brand to deliver these supposedly deep insights and a new way of looking at the world and to open people's eyes. But it's connected to like conspiracy theories are also totalizing worldviews, and and cults also inculcate a totalizing worldview. So if you ask me about that theory for everything, well, there's multiple reasons. One is that they're narcissists and that every idea that pops into their heads they think is absolutely amazing and they never criticize their own ideas. Um, so that there's that. But, but also it's quite helpful that if you're going to be a guru, it's no good to say, oh, look, I've thought about things a little bit and I have this small contribution to make, which isn't really connected. But here's another thing. People don't want that. People want the whole package. They want to be told how to live their life what's really going on, how does the world work, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 th and that's what they, and that's, that's the product they deliver. 42. 42, yep. <laughs> well, it, it, it's almost like they, um, you know, these symptoms that you described can also be, you know, termed as they have sort of collective schizophrenia because they have delusions of grand grandeur, delusions of persecution, and that's, two out of four delusions, <laughs> schizophrenia. So it's almost like, you know, and, and this is what cults also have, but, you know, to, to a lesser extent, these sort of online groups also have that and you know, they provide people with a meaning that, you know, what they're doing is actually some sort of meaningful, even though it actually, you know, in a very objective sense does not seem to make sense because, you um, I'm not a mathematician. I cannot, you know, tell if Eric Weinstein's theory of everything is any relevant or not. But those who are actually mathematicians, nobody seems to take him seriously. And this is because obviously there is a sort of cabal which is, you know, stopping <laughs> Weinstein's theory from getting out. And he actually seems to think that it's going to help us in time travel. Mm. And, and also develop interstellar space travel. How's that working out? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's hard to parody, isn't it? Like that level of grandiosity. But um, yeah, that's the thing with narcissism, I suppose. It knows no he, bounds. In his paper, he explicitly writes that this is a work of entertainment, and that no one is allowed to build into it until until the author with the until the express uh, permission of the author. And that just, you know, if you're writing a scientific paper and that disclaimer just gives it away. It's like, this is supposed to be a scientific paper. And if you're calling it a form of entertainment and you don't want people to be built on it, then how honest are you actually in, you know, do you really believe that this is really the theory of everything? I well, look, I mean, my take on that, and this is speculation, of course, I don't know what's going on in his mind when he writes things like that, but we see this a lot in terms of when you look at what the gurus are saying and how they say it, they often use these caveats and disclaimers. Yeah, so for instance, in one of, I think it's Brett, Brett's episodes, he'll say, look, we're not doing um, um, conspiracy theorizing here. We're doing conspiracy hypothesizing. Uh, you know, so... And then, so there's this disclaimer, and then, and and then they'll they'll often issue a disclaimer, and then go ahead and do exactly the thing that they said that they said that they're not doing, right? But so it's this kind of little, it's like kind of little get out of jail free card, you know? Like so, if people, you can say the the sort of the really extreme or out there stuff, but then if anyone criticizes you on it or pushes back too much, you can say, oh, well, now I, I said we're just hypothesizing here, you know, this, you know, and it, it's. So anyway, we see this pattern a lot. So I think, I think that was his insurance policy in case he was ridiculed or whatever. Then you know it, it's a bit like the Pepe the Frog, the kind of the ironic shit posting of the alt right. You know, you sort of not comparing him to the alt right necessarily, but it's that kind of well, I was just joking. You know, this is you know you shouldn't have taken this seriously. Ha ha, jokes on you, really. You know, like the, it's I, I see that tactic a lot. And one of the person who does not do that, or does not give any caveats is Nassim Taleb. <laughs> <laughs> he seems to be pretty out there. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, separates all of these uh, people from him is that he is very blunt in what he says. He would, 
outright abuse people and you know everybody who does not agree his block essentially everybody who doesn't agree with me i think he has blocked you he has blocked me he has blocked most people who don't agree with him and <laughs> that you know only he is his followers are also only he is right and um everybody who doesn't agree with him his favorite word is prostitute and uh, knaves an idiot he has called steven pinker a nitwick and shallaren you know and when you actually read his critique it's not substantial um uh, i read his critique of steven pinker it doesn't seem like he actually read the book he's attributing position to pinker that pinker yeah. himself does not really believe in he's saying that pinker you know believes in long peace that there is going to be no more war but pinker explicitly denies that you know in almost every chapter of the better angels of nature the, the book that he critiqued so why do you think that you know someone like nasim nicolas talib and one of the other things that he has in uh, you know with uh, the other gurus is his hatred for uh, the field of statistics that you know statisticians are useless this is like brett weinstein says in the current evolutionary theory is useless uh, yeah. eric weinstein's you know current academia is useless it's, it's the yeah. same sort of yes pessimism. i mean like you you're noticing the same patterns we are yeah like it's not a coincidence yeah that every one of these gurus says that the entire field in which they're kind of positioning themselves are idiots and and wrong and wasting their time except for me yeah it it's it's just so much like a cult leader who says that all of those other religions uh and all of those other prophets are false you know only i will teach you the truth so there's that going on um but before i give you my uh, talk about this into lab um would I just I think I'm running out of batteries with my things I'm getting warnings on my headphones sorry I could just get a, another pair I think and we could continue perhaps if we pause the recording for a moment uh yeah great right uh so where were we we're talking about the lab the lab yeah well I'm quite I'm quite proud of the um the title of our episode for that one um no seem to lab everything these idiots frauds and assholes don't understand <laughs> <laughs> um yeah look I, i i it's weird i have a soft spot for teleb like i actually do have a bit of a soft spot for jordan peterson because even yeah. though he is something of a you know a jungian mystic he's he manages to be interesting mm-hmm. a lot of the time and same with taleb he's 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 clearly a smart guy and very interesting and you know i i think i think people could get some good insight from reading say say his books on black swan events and so on where of course he goes wrong is just takes it too far you know <laughs> he, he a lot of his insights are so it's interesting that when statisticians read his books they often quite like him but they think he's a philosopher they don't think he's a mathematician <laughs> or a probability theorist they think it's quite interesting philosophy because that's actually what it is you know he he he's he's famous for like he, he, even the black swan events right that's it's really more of a philosophical point of view which is to you know keep you know keep them be mindful of unknown unknowns just because it hasn't happened in this particular way before doesn't mean it's not going to happen there that there are limits to induction that kind of thing And you know those are perfectly good insights I think if you're someone who's interested in worrying about stock markets and things like that. But yeah, in terms of his wholesale trashing of the field of statistics and one of his latest ones was trashing IQ. Yeah, mm-hmm. he just he just went on a he went on a deep dive into IQ and 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 that captured my attention because that's actually something I know something about. I'm not an I'm not an IQ researcher, but I am, you know, I do specialize in statistics and psychometrics. So I I understand the literature and have an awareness for the kind of evidence that exists there for uh IQ. Um and so I I read his critique with some interest looked over the evidence and yeah it was really very bad and demonstrably wrong in pretty much every respect. So I think the thing to understand about Nelson Taleb is that he's not a statistician and he doesn't read the statistics literature. A bit like you were explaining here he does he didn't read the Pinker book that he was trashing. He's not interested in it, you know, he he just assumes that because you know he he's he is a mathematician, has background in probability, is I'm sure is good at that and I guess has that sort of narcissistic 
self-belief and feels that he can just basically um, reinvent um, and, and it just, yeah, it has this amazing self-confidence, if not narcissism, in, in believing that no single person has thought of any of those possible criticisms before and that he's just figured it out sort of on the back of a napkin or with a very limited kind of investigation. So, yeah, he would definitely benefit from, yeah, just sometimes you actually, it's not enough just to be smart. You actually have to do the work. <laughs> yeah. And he has no semblance of humility. He doesn't pretend to be humble, you know, like Jordan Peterson keeps saying, you know, when he, he doesn't know or, you know, he had all of these other figures, you know, they have sort of, they keep saying that they're humble, they're open to new points of view. The lab, you don't find that at all, you know, he's no. just straight out there. So in that yeah, it's, it's actually kind of entertaining, isn't it? Like in that, like he's, like I, it's kind of refreshing in a way that he's, he's there's no false modesty. <laughs> he's, he's like a rampaging red blooded intellectual bull in a china shop. And, you know, you have to, you have to give him points for that. Yep. And that really helps because, you know, he's being honest. You know that he's being honest with himself. So, you know, you can recognize that, you know, it's like if a racist is open, it's much easier, you know, otherwise if you're like closeted racist then it's going to be difficult and people will obviously not want to associate with you, but, you know, you need to know who is a racist or not. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. No, that that's right. It's quite, it's quite easy to see, you know, he's quite frank. I'm, uh, I'm a genius and you're a bunch of idiots and frauds. So, you know, you, you, know, you can, <laughs> you, you, you know where you stand. And, uh, yeah, look, and, but look, he's, he's entertaining as well. You know, I think a lot of people catastrophize about the, the various gurus too a little bit. I mean, I think some of them do do uh, a fair amount of harm in various ways, yeah. particularly on, you know, the, spe the specific topics, obviously, where I wish people would please not spread disinformation or even entertain these speculative conspiracy hypotheses things vaccine. like like things like vaccines it's also harmful just to people's brains even though ev evolution doesn't hasn't got a like a practical applied thing in most people's lives you know it's just harmful to the the intellectual discourse if you're telling people that oh it's all completely wrong and they don't know anything because i've got this brand new theory so look, they are harmful. Don't get me wrong, but um, yeah, I I also don't like to exaggerate or catastrophize about how harmful they are. As I said, Nassim Taleb, you know, has written interesting books, and and he's a bit of an asshole. But you know, that's okay. He's not he's mm -hmm. not he's not strangling anybody. He's just he's just being rude to them. <laughs> um, and um, you know, Jordan Peterson, yes, he has some troubling connections. Um, and and he, look, he, he is a Christian conservative, right? And, and with, with, I'm sure, very old Christian, fashioned not views. in a conventional sense, because you know, if you ask him whether he believes in resurrection, he's going to say, you know, I will take 30 years to answer that. Well, okay, yes, yes. I think I feel yes, I feel deep. Okay, let's say deep down on a metaphysical level, he's a metaphysical Christian. But um, you know, and um, so there's lots of views I disagree with. But you know, at, at the same time, if you actually read his self help books, as we did. Um, you know, like a lot of people just um, get benefit from that simply because it, it gives them basic advice, like, um, you know, just try not to stress about things that you can't change and start by organizing the little things in your life and working on from there. So look, I, I haven't, um, people of course will cite some of his, you know, exclusionary views or, you know, views that could be construed as being um, harmful to um uh, marginalized groups and so on which and i'm sure there's truth in that as well but just on the basis of his his self-help books which is the thing that m most people know him by that you know it's it's not particularly toxic yeah well i find him to be interesting and not because of his self-help book because i've read uh, all of his books and you know i just don't like his writing his very rambly style but, you know, I get when he get, talks about his clients and all, you know, I see him as if, you know, he's probably a good therapist. Um, and, you know, he describes his clients in very good details and that could be helpful to some people. You know, yeah. the problem with his writing is he writes like he speaks. It's like lecture transcripts. 
So if you have like watched his lectures and you just don't get much out of his writings. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. but I do find him interesting because I watched his psychology sort of personality psychology lecture and I, it was pretty conventional basic psychology. And if he concentrated more on that, on, you know, popularizing psychology, I think he would be good in that. But mm. he focuses more on the philosophical, religious, political aspect of it, which, you know, he doesn't really bother to go that deep into. He doesn't bother to read Marx, but then goes on to criticize Marx. He doesn't bother to read the postmodernist, then goes on to criticize postmodernist. This is not to say that his criticism is incorrect, but it's definitely not well informed. Yes. Right. So yeah. while I agree with his criticism of postmodernism, I don't think that you know he has actually bothered to read the postmodernist in question and gives them the due credit that they deserve. So um, yeah, I see that with um, Jordan Peterson, and you know one of the things that you mentioned uh, about IQ. Uh, you know what I find with a lot of psychologists is that they focus now. Taleb may be wrong on IQ, but uh, a lot of psychologists sort of dismiss the information processing models entirely and say that, you know, only the psychometric models and in the psychometric models, they would be more dismissive of something like, say, um, the Das and Aguilari's past model, and they would be more, you know, accepting towards IQ or you know, even be more dismissive towards the projective techniques of the um, Ravens matrices and all of those things. So I think IQ sort of measures a very narrow kind of intelligence. It might have some predictive capacity, but for instance, creativity, you know, is the most obvious example. The correlation is essentially zero IQ and creativity. Oh. Yeah. Right? Well, for, for, from a psychometrician's point of view, that's a good thing. Yeah. Because creativity is not intelligence, right? Like it's, it's a separate construct. So, you know, I, I think, you know, the intelligence, the, the reason why intelligence got into trouble as a, as a field of study is that it's a topic which has a high sort of salience and a high value in society generally. So, so people are interested in it. You know, people often, you know, when, when someone's meeting someone or gets to know someone, you know, they might they might think of them as you know, um, you know, um, good looking or not good looking or intelligent or not good intelligent and so on. It's 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 kind of a you know a thing that people care about. Now, so that's why it gets into to trouble because people's intuitions about what it means and what it doesn't mean and what it should do and what it shouldn't do is a little bit different from what the the technical purpose of the construct is. And I, I think I generally agree with, I think with what you're saying, which is that it is a limited construct. Like it's crazy to think there's this, there's any number or even a set of numbers that could describe somebody's capabilities and, and potential. It just simply doesn't exist. We're extremely complicated um, individuals, e even in personality to take, a, to take a different kind of psychometrics. Yeah, that the most, you're probably aware, the most well-supported um, personality model is the big five ocean model, things like openness to experience and extroversion, conscientiousness and so on. Now that has, you know, um, good statistical evidence behind it. Yeah. And sub subject to methodological limitations and some cultural specificity and so on. But knowing those five numbers, that still doesn't tell you very much because your personality is extremely complicated. It's like a fractal, yeah? Th those five numbers might describe the sort of main spokes on the thing. It's like a snowflake, yeah? We're all special snowflakes. and th But then each of them has sort of sub-facets and sub-facets and sub-facets until it gets extraordinarily specific. And we might have a collection of hundreds and hundreds of numbers, which might, if we could interpret that, we could we could get some sort of sense of, of a person. So, you know, IQ, you've got to think of IQ as like that. You know, yes, th there is evidence for a a sort of a, a, um, a unitary um, um, cognitive ability measure. So things like the 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 the, the Weschler Adult IQ scale revised incorporates I think is it ten or a dozen different subtests, which includes things like uh, visual manipulation tasks and includes um, um, you know, doing arithmetic operations, but also includes vocabulary tests and a whole range of other tests. Now, each of those tests is quite inadequate 
you know, and not not particular, you know, very narrow. And but the important thing is, is that that IQ thing actually captures the the commonality. So if you think of it like as a Venn diagram, you have all these different tests, and it it captures that kind of common common variance, common component across all of those things. So we could include more tests, but the thing that they would have in common with all the others is what's captured by IQ. So, but I, to return to what you're saying, I can't. I agree with you that it is a limited thing and and has a limited purpose. Like it has a purpose in research. Yeah, we can we we can we can measure it just like we can measure um, impulsivity. Yeah, we talked about impulsivity earlier, just just as a, as a thing that could be useful for quite to you know just for academic pers- purposes to understand other things. Um, but in terms of people's everyday life or understanding about politics or making decisions about um, education, it has very limited pl- practical application. The only the only practical application that I'm aware of is that where it should be used for either in le- law, legal cases to understand whether somebody is mentally competent to stand trial. And it could well be quite a bad measure. Like it could be the worst, it could be far from ideal. But when you think about it, what's the alternative? The alternative is to maybe you know, just leave it to somebody's subjective judgment. What if the person is unsympathetic and wants wants to wants to get them convicted and so on? So, sometimes you need to have an objective measure to make a fairer decision. Uh, and and the other aspect is in terms of say, you know, um, understanding where kids might benefit from. You know, they they might be struggling with school, getting poor grades. Now there could be multiple reasons for that. They could just be not trying very hard. They could have um, social or emotional adjustment problems, in which case that would call for different interventions. But, 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 but if they are um, scoring very low, it's the subnormal on, on, the, um, on the standardized IQ test, then, then that, that provides um, some, some evidence for what would be the most beneficial intervention. They, they, might, they might be better off in some sort of special schooling or whatever. So, you know, I, I, I think um, I think most people shouldn't think about IQ very much, yeah, <laughs> uh, and not not at least in terms of how psychologists and researchers think about it. It's um, it, it, it's useful in just a few quite specific situations and can be used irresponsibly. Yeah, there are cases in history of it of it being used for yeah to to sort of justify racist policies, immigration policies, for instance. Um, but you know, used responsibly, it 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 is a helpful thing um, by by professionals. Apart from that, it's it's purely, you know, people work with IQ in terms of the in terms of average effects. You know, like I, I mentioned before about young men being impulsive and also having a propensity for gambling problems. Well, that doesn't mean that if you're a young and a man, you're definitely going to have gambling problems. It just means, on average, young men are going to be. Likely. Yeah, more likely. So, you know, one would use IQ as a measure in a in a research sense in a in a similar kind of vein. We we don't place this huge amount of weight on it in terms of giving us the this is the this is the this magical number tells me <laughs> tells me, you know, that's you and now we know all about you. No, it's just it's just like another measure like like behavioral impulsivity that we might use. Do you think that it's possible that other kinds of intelligences exist, say, you know, something like um, Gardner's multiple intelligence and, you know, people have criticized it as unscientific and not, you know, measurable in data, but uh, let's say something, it's a musical intelligence. So it is quite possible that we do not have a measure uh, for you know, something like musical intelligence does not mean that musical intelligence in itself does not exist. Mm. It could be that in future we will invent a test for you know, measuring musical, musical intelligence in the same way that we have for IQ. And I think uh, some Harvard psychologists already have um, mm. developed a musical sort of IQ it's in his you know, recent yearly stages. Yeah. So. Do you think it's possible that other forms of intelligences exist, but are not, you know, as, mm. you know, scientific as say IQ? Because we okay. need to understand that IQ itself, when it started, um, you know, had ridiculous questions because you know, in the Simon Binet test, there was, um, you know, people were asked to choose which one of these faces is, you know, more beautiful and which one of these is ugly. And there was yeah. a, 
face of the black chair. So, you know, it was racism was ingrained in that test. And, you know, did, did we have come so far because of scientific developments. And so do you think that in case of other intelligences that in the future we will have uh, mm. these other kinds of intelligences? Look, um, before commenting on that, it's, it's important to understand that it's, it's really a descriptive measure. So we must be careful not to reify the idea of intelligence, like it's like some sort of platonic thing that exists somewhere, either in our heads or, or elsewhere. It, it, it's not, right? It's, it's you know, it, it's kind of a, if you can think of it as like a bottom-up process of all of the, you know, the, the immense complexity that goes on in our neuroanatomical, social, cultural, um, ontological, and um, you know, just 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 physical development. What what you end up is this is 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 with a, a kind of a, a level of, of of functioning, and we see from from just observation that there appears to be some commonality. So even with musical intelligence, right? I think you would probably find that there would be some sort of measure of. G, yeah, in the terms of people that are very high propensity for doing well at music tend to be good at a little bit better on average at maths than most people and so on, right? So, so really it's just a descriptive measure. It just describes that common variance, that intersection of the Venn diagram, but it's not a, it's not a real thing. It's like you're just describing something that is really the composite of many parts, but just happens to go together. Um, so, it, it isn't so it isn't real in a material or physical sense it's it's describing the sum of its parts so it's kind of analogous to something like um so so we talk about economic development for instance to, to, to describe countries now that's not a real thing it's actually a composite you know you've got you know level of um um you know education systems you know um maybe legal systems um, you know, a whole, whole bunch of other things, health, health, did I mention health systems? So there's a whole bunch of that stuff going on and you put, the, the, there's, there's no reason they have to go together. They just tend to go together. So you abstract away from all of the details to, to describe this sort of thing that sort of tends to go together, but it's not a real thing. Is So that so that's the point I want to, it's a, it's a kind of a subtle point to make. So to answer your question about, is there, you know, could, could we find a, 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 you know, kind of music and stuff? Well, you know, maybe, I, I, you know, I'm sure it, it's in principle possible to measure something like a propensity for being good at music and learning music easily and mastering instruments easily and, and, and so on. But, you know, so we might hypothetically develop some kind of measure that gives us a pretty good indication of someone's general ability at playing musical instruments or composing music or reading music and even appreciating music. Um, but that doesn't make it a real thing. You know what I mean? It's it's just a it's it's a descriptor. So the answer is yes. But you know, it, it, once you start to get into more specific things, you know, you start talking about well, you could have an intelligence for riding a bike, an intelligence for you know doing all kinds of things, and it, it sort of loses its meaning when when you when you get into specifics. It's yeah, you might as well just talk about abilities, I suppose, or, or yeah, personality. Yeah. Yeah, abilities or propensities, I suppose. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, I think you know it's good to be cautious about things like IQ, and not. I mean, the important point to make is not to reify it. You know, it's not. It's it's an abstraction that we create to describe a statistical um, relationship that we see among disparate. Um, uh, abilities that involve some sort of high level of cognitive sort of functioning and and um, yeah that's that's kind of all it is it's not a it's not a real thing so I so I'm a dead set you know uh, materialist and you know psychology generally is founded on um, you know modern psychology is not Jungian or Freudian <laughs> or whatever you know we're, we we try to be scientific even though we're not very good at it sometimes um, and, you know, so we, at, at basis, we, we are materialists. So, so the material reality is nothing but chemistry and neurons and so on. But, you know, so we have these sort of abstract high level descriptors like IQ, like impulsivity, but we always have to keep in mind that these are just concepts that may be useful for us to describe patterns that we see, um, but they're not we mustn't reify them and imagine that they're sort of 
yeah, like platonic things sitting out there somewhere. Yeah. But you have to understand that the reason people hate IQ so much and you know the reason this topic is so contentious is because the actual researchers, you know, the pioneers in the field have, you know, been responsible for it, its verification. You know, someone like Arthur Jensen, you know, who founded, you know, talked, I think he was the first one to talk about the G factor. Um, and differentiate between the G factor and specific factors, um, oh, really? oh, associative right. learning. Mm. So Arthur Jensen is a pioneer in that field. Mm. Um, Robert Plomin is a pioneer in that field. And, uh, you know, Charles Murray has obviously taken that to an, another extent on the cognitive elite idea. But these sort of researchers have a deep understanding of the topic and have actually done you know are actually popular intelligence researchers these are not you know non-mainstream figures so when mainstream intelligence researchers you know verify the idea of iq so much and promote it like you know they do so you cannot you know expect the general public to sort of pretend like it's just descriptive and it doesn't matter that much and you know so that sort of the contentious the controversy to me, seems to be quite justified in this sense. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of those controversial figures, I kind of learnt about, or some of them at least, I learnt about for the first time after being on Twitter. And then, so it. So as I said, I'm not an IQ researcher. I didn't specialize in it. But you know, it obviously gets covered during one's undergraduate. And to be honest, I'm not somebody who pays attention to names. I, I don't tend to pay attention to names that much. So I, I, I may well have forgotten them. Um, but yeah, look, it's it's I'm I'm aware of the you know there's obviously been a problematic history with the the psychometric testing, um, um, particularly early on. But as you say, there are still people who have you know a strong research track record in the field that are you know I guess weaponizing the idea in 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 ways that are harmful and a very justifiable public pushback on that. So. Yeah, you know, I think I think it's understandable. I also think that the I, th I think I think we have to acknowledge, and this is getting a bit into that naturalistic fallacy thing a little bit, right? I think I think you know we are all good, you know, us us modern progressive people, right? We we are democratic people, yeah. We we value democratic principles, we value egalitarian principles, we value cosmopolitan type principles, you know the. Um, we believe in equal rights and things like that. So the whole concept of measuring people according to on some scale that is thought of as good, I think rubs people the wrong way for, for very understandable and natural reasons. So we're okay with measuring people on things that are more, um, I guess, morally or, you know, value neutral, like extroversion, introversion. Right. Yeah. It's statistically speaking, it's far weaker. And, and theoretically speaking, it's far weaker <laughs> concept than IQ. Right. But we don't, it doesn't really cause any problems because it's okay to be introverted. It's okay to be extroverted. It's okay to be in the middle. Right. Where everyone gets that, but you know, there's something, the problem with IQ is the, the value that we invest in it. Yeah, that as a society we invest in it. Now, being, I think, in a more natural kind of environment and not the modern technocratic kind of society we live in today, where, you know, being smart is everything. Yeah, it's, you know, getting into a good school, getting a good job, and a good job is considered a job that demands a high level of intellectual abilities. You know, whereas, you know, we, we don't value the job so much that, that don't. Whereas that wasn't always the case. It just wasn't that important to be, to be, you know, an egghead, a boffin, you know, the kind of person who, you know, could be um, be missing a whole lot of other important human qualities. But as long as they're kind of good at, you know, you know, um, uh, inverting matrices and balancing spreadsheets and 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 so on, then they can be super successful. The kind of people, um, you know, so we've got this very. Our modern world has invested a lot of value into this particular trait. And yeah, and as you said, the researchers too have been guilty of, of, of reifying it and investing too much in it as well. Um, so yeah, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do that stuff. We should just. 
Well, I hope people don't and I've uh, taken nearly two hours of your time, but I'll end by talking about uh, one of the gurus that you've covered. Uh, and I think from all the gurus that you've covered, I'm probably most sympathetic to two gurus, which is um, I'm sympathetic to ContraPoints and Sam Harris. And I want to talk about Sam Harris. So how does okay. he fit into Guru Meter? Yes, yes. Um, yes, so we have... Um, so my, my, my collaborator and co-host, uh, Christopher Kavanagh, is much more familiar with Sam Harris than me. So I must say, I, as I mentioned, I was a fan of uh, Richard Dawkins' um, uh, writings on evolution because they were just fantastic. Um, but I, I actually wasn't, I, I did read a couple of his books on um, religion and atheism, but it, I didn't really care about it that much. I was, I was an atheist as since as long as I can remember from a non-religious family. So I didn't really need, I just wasn't interested in, I didn't need to hear my pre-existing worldview supported. And I suppose I never really got into Sam Harris for the same reason. So, you know, I've um, I attempted to, to, I've spent a bit of time listening to Sam Harris, but not a great deal, I have to say, because to be honest, I personally find him a little bit boring. Just, it's just the he way he talks. He has a soporific voice. He has a soporific voice and he's, he's so kind of, um, that kind of elaborate way of extreme, uh, meticulous way of, of talking, um, I find a bit tedious, but um, look, I've but I've heard a couple of his his podcasts and thought they were perfectly fine. Uh, now, Chris would be far better place to speak to this because I know he's been following very carefully and has a lot of good things to say about him, but also a lot of bad things to say about him. Um, but for my part, what's fresh in my mind is just that um, um, that most recent, very short um thing that he released actually so there were two short things he released so let's let's be even handed about this there, were, there was one thing he released which was basically condemning those people in the idw who have gone over to conspiracy theories and maga land you know um rhetoric and you know sam harris to his eternal credit just called out all of these people who, who he you know knows and is friendly with in many cases as, as saying that's batshit crazy and you're all you all need to shape up and take a good hard look at yourselves and um you know whereas a lot of people don't do that to their to their you know friends and colleagues because um this is the game that's played pretty much kind of being being nice to the other gurus or, or being nice to other public figures i should say um because that's to your benefit um I was a bit less impressed upon listening to his uh, second um, sort of shorter thing where he was, um, you know, it was a bit of a shame to hear someone who who did make his mark in terms of atheism and in terms of criticising that kind of religious thinking, who was sort of uh, really given the, um, using what seemed to be um, this sort of recourse to kind of ineffable knowledge and that if you didn't agree with him then that was because you you hadn't done the work and that you needed to um uh practice his um type of meditation in, to in order to understand where he was coming from so so that that was a bit unimpressive um so yeah look i i think sam is 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 a mixture of 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 things i think he's he is far, far better than people like Eric or Brett Weinstein. Um, I think in many cases, he's pretty even handed. In some cases, he's too open minded. For instance, in talking about, we just talked about IQ before, but I, he was talking to yeah. the, um, uh, what's his name, the author of Charles the Bell Murray. Charles, Charles Murray. Murray. Yeah. Um, and, and really seemed to just give him a pass and not take him up and simply take it take a lot of things on faith without checking. Um, so yeah, Sam Harris, a mixed bag. Well, I do agree with that because he also has a soft spot for Buddhism. You know, he would often, you know, promote Buddhist concepts, but without sort of the, you can, you know, even Thompson, uh, who is an atheist with a Buddhist background, he has written an entire book and he goes into detail criticizing the likes of Sam Harris. So, you know, there, and he also has a blind spot uh, 
from criticism. You talked about Charles Murray. So uh, in his conversation with Ezra Klein, I don't know yeah. if you watched yeah. it. I'm familiar so, with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, think, that's, a, that's another good example, isn't it? Yeah. So I think Ezra Klein sort of, you know, was very willing to engage with him and, you know, was open to him. But Sam Harris, you know, his mind was sort of closed. He had already decided that Ezra was misrepresenting him. But, mm. you know, I think um, Ezra Klein sort of um, did well in that conversation with Sam Harris and pointed out the problems quite well. But so Sam Harris sort of has this blind spot when it comes to criticisms. Uh, and uh, But generally speaking, uh, his podcast is great and uh, you know i get a lot of my reading recommendations from his podcast and he talks about a variety of fields not like dave rubin um mm -hmm. when are you covering dave rubin by the way oh yeah the, the only thing stopping us from covering dave rubin is that he'd just be so boring my god just like a broken record um yeah no no look i look i look i i, I I don't really disagree with with your take there on Sam Harris. I could imagine somebody listening to a large proportion of his content, and there's, there's really nothing guru like or problematic from my point of view at all. He's not doesn't happen to me my cup of tea just because it's just it's just not. But um, yeah, Chris would probably be able to cite you a few other sort of egregious. Um, um, uh, um, transgressions that Sam has made, but yeah, that those those two examples, the um, the Murray and the Ezra Klein thing, are, uh, um, and also that most recent thing on, on on Buddhism and meditation, I think, shows some of the blind spots. But hey, you know, none of us are none of us are perfect, are we? So, yeah. Yep. So let's wrap this up. I would love to have uh, your co-host on, Chris. Um, Kavanaugh, so maybe put in a good word for me. Yes. Okay. I will. I will indeed. I will indeed. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll let him know that it was good fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, to the viewers, like, share, subscribe, and uh, your Twitter profile is Arthur C. Dent, the Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy character. So get, yep. follow him on Twitter. Yep. Um, Check out his podcast. Links in the description below. Thank you. And we're done. Thank you.